If you haven't noticed, the launch of the M2 2022 MacBook Air has generated a lot of hullabaloo. The drama, as is often the case, has taken nuggets of verifiable truth and then aggrandized them to sensationalistic proportions. Which then, well, it causes the staunch Apple defenders to establish equally groundless armament in defense of Apple. It's merely this news cycle's overplayed trope of haters versus fanboys. Look, I've spent the last several weeks actually testing the new MacBook Air, and surprise, both sides are wrong. In this video, we will discuss my data-backed performance findings and why, despite my personal belief that this is one of Apple's best computers yet, its value proposition is not. Now, before we talk the M2 chip, let's talk everything else, because just looking at the spec sheet, there really isn't much new from the previous generation aside from the chip. There's a new design, there's a different display, kind of, the addition of MagSafe, uh, there's more speakers, and a 1080p webcam, up from 720p. But that's it. However, as is always the case, specs tell only a very little portion of the story, and I have discovered other unstated changes. We'll explore those in a minute, but let's focus on design quickly. The new design is nice, and I do prefer it to the M1 MacBook Air. It's just that the mass is more evenly distributed. The fat bottom radii, oh, they make the rockin' world go round, and it feels so nice in the hand. Things are new, after four years of the same. But I don't really resonate with the people that are heralding this machine as impossibly thin or reminiscent of the 12-inch MacBook. It's not. Cut! Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that guy's got a nice shirt. And if you're not thinking that, you're thinking, hey, I got a nice shirt. Well, that's thanks to today's sponsor, Cuts Clothing. If you don't know about Cuts, they take the work out of fashion by giving you high quality, wrinkle-free, pre-shrunk shirts. And the collars, they don't stretch out. They've got a lot of pretty people on their website, like this guy, to show you different varying styles and cuts. Eh? so that you can see what fits your body best. And they make a lot of other stuff too. Fall themed long sleeves for when you're in the woods. Sweats for when you're chilly. And even shirts for church or a safari. So I bet by now you've solved the riddle. You know what the C stands for on my hat. That's right, conjunctivitis, which is what people are going to get if you keep wearing those dirty old wrinkly cheap clothes without stepping up your game thanks to cuts. All you gotta do is start a YouTube channel and get them to sponsor you, or save 15% off your first order by going to cuts.team slash snazzy or using code snazzy. Okay, that's all. It's not, it's just a new design. <laughs> Volumetrically, it's nearly identical to the outgoing MacBook Air, and it's only 5% lighter. A 12 inch MacBook, it is not. This design is evolutionary, not revolutionary. The addition of MagSafe, however, is a nice perk. And while not everyone is a fan of MagSafe, you're wrong. It is great. And I am a fan. Surely anyone can admit that not having to use a hub or lose 50% of your IO when you need power is nice. Remember, this computer just has two Type-C connectors. However, one complaint that I have with the M2 MagSafe's receiver is that due to the sloped edge of the case bottom, the lower half of the MagSafe port doesn't have an aluminum sidewall to help retain the connector like on the 14-inch MacBook Pro and 16-inch. And given that MagSafe 3 has the lowest mating surface area yet of any MagSafe generation, if you're using this laptop in your lap <laughs> with the cable plugged in, it's extremely easy to dislodge. A deal breaker? No, but the connector certainly holds better in the MagSafe 3 MacBook Pro. Speaking of the MacBook Pro, I have absolutely loved the keyboard on mine over the last year. So I suppose that the M2 MacBook Air would just inherit its feel directly, but it doesn't. The new MacBook Air has a fairly significant amount of deck flex. Now it's nothing like on most PC laptops, but it's certainly more than on any recent MacBook. Additionally, key stability seems worse to me. They wiggle a little bit when your fingers come down at an angle, whereas the M1 MacBook Pro feels much more linear. And I can still type on it just as quickly, and it seems like it will be reliable, but it does feel a little cheaper. As does the trackpad, in fact. In our teardown of this machine, we discovered that it was the exact same trackpad we've seen in other recent laptops, which frankly surprised me because it feels and sounds so much more hollow. Again, like the keyboard, it works perfectly fine, 
but it feels cheap and sounds like, well, like a haptic vibration motor, something that every MacBook since the original haptic trackpad's 2015 debut has been able to avoid. Just listen to this comparison versus the old M1 MacBook Air. I think some of the hollow resonance sound is literally a result of the thin aluminum bracket and general open air behind the trackpad, and that's a space that just doesn't exist on previous models. Now, if it seems like I'm nitpicking, I am. However, when your new entry-level laptop is $200 more expensive than the outgoing entry-level laptop, things should be better. Everything should be better. Luckily, the speakers are, they're perfectly adequate. They do get louder than the M1 Air, and I think that the instrument separation is a little better. Now, they're very bright, they're super treble heavy, and they definitely feel less bassy than the already not very bassy M1 Air. But unlike that machine, the M2 never gets muddy or distorted. The improvement is minor, but noticeable. With that said, they get absolutely destroyed by the M1 MacBook Pro. But that really shouldn't surprise anyone. I mean, look at these speakers. They take up a ton of volume that just doesn't exist, isn't available in the MacBook Air. Another minor but noticeable improvement is the display. The extra screen real estate afforded by the menu bar moving above the 16 by 10 display gives a noticeable improvement in vertical real estate. Remember, the notch is not cutting into the screen. It's amongst extra screen. <laughs> this is just like the MacBook Pro upon its release. The display also gained an extra 100 nits of brightness with a new peak of 500 candela. And we measure that it's actually a little bit better than that. It is noticeably brighter when side by side with the old model, but it's not so much brighter that you would be lost without it, especially considering that it still lacks HDR support. Now the panel does officially support the P3 color gamut, but frankly, it measures very close in color accuracy to the old air. With its single backlight, we only measured a contrast ratio of about 1200 to one, which is a slight improvement over the M1 Air, but it is a far cry from the 50,000 to one contrast ratio of the MacBook Pros. Those mini LED displays are so nice. High frame rate also sticks to the Pro lineup. The M2 MacBook Air has a 60 Hertz refresh lock. The hardware changes are iterative, but they are solid and they are inoffensive. All the drama about this machine has surrounded two issues on the inside, thermal throttling and disk performance. So let's talk about them. Now the M2 MacBook chip is built on the same basic architecture as the M1, which means that a performance increase is as a result of either IPC gains, frequency increases, or both. Let's say that I need to carry LTT store water bottles from the office to my Linus Shrine. Now the number of bottles that I can carry at a single time is my instructions per clock, my IPC, and the rate at which I can run to the shrine is my clock speed. If we're to assume that the M2 inherits the same changes found on the A15, upon which the M2 is built, then we should experience a minor increase in multi-threaded workloads thanks to an IPC increase in the chip's efficiency course. But ultimately, an increase in clock speed is what is accounting for performance improvements this year. And an increase in frequency scaling on the same microarchitecture, which the M2 is, typically results in a reduction of efficiency and an increase in heat output, which if not accounted for, can result in dreaded thermal throttling. Now, lots of pundits and YouTubers were quick to criticize the M2 Air's thin stamped heat shield as an inferior cooling method to the more passive traditional heat spreader found on the M1 Air. Alas, they did so in error. Everyone is forgetting this. I don't know why, but the M1 MacBook Air also thermally throttled uh, by about 12% in multi-core workloads. We just don't remember because 12% wasn't that big of a deal and such a powerful computer and such an impossibly thin fanless design seemed otherworldly upon its release. The M2 MacBook Air is not unlike its predecessor. And while it does thermally throttle, it does so by even less, only about nine to 11% in our testing. And it takes about seven minutes in our 72 degree Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius office to fully heat soak itself. This is frankly remarkable when compared to the much more thermally efficient M1 chip that reaches its maximum throttle after just 90 seconds on the 2020 MacBook Air. Even when fully throttled, the M2 MacBook Air still outperforms an unthrottled, actively cooled M1. 
Now, as you're seeing from these benchmark results, the M2 doesn't show massive intergenerational improvements, but that's because it's the same generation, literally cut from the same cloth. So to see a 7 to 10% single core, 18 to 20% multi core, and 20 to 25 GPU core improvement, I mean, that's really quite impressive, especially when you consider that our testing found nearly identical battery life between the two models. The whole throttling scandal, it's manufactured. <laughs> Apple willingly compromised some performance in the pursuit of form factor. But if you absolutely cannot tolerate that and will not increase your budget to, say, an M1 Pro machine, they sell the same chip in an ugly, touch bar laden, fan sporting M2 MacBook Pro for the same price that doesn't thermally throttle at all. It's a nothing burger. The other controversy, however, is one that I believe may have sharper teeth. For those not in the loop, every M2 MacBook Air ships with room for two NAND flash modules. Now, in last year's MacBook Air, the 256 gig base model storage option shipped populated with two 128 gig flash chips. Now, in the new MacBook Air, instead of shipping with two smaller chips, they just ship with one 256 gig flash chip. The end result is an entry-level MacBook Air that is much slower in disk performance than its predecessor. And it is much slower, about 40% slower than the prior MacBook Air, and nearly 50% the speed of the exact same machine in a 512 gig capacity. Of course, the question becomes, okay, well, yeah, whatever, will I notice? Yeah, <laughs> you probably will. Transferring small files in bulk doesn't yield a great difference. However, moving large files like videos and full res raw photos takes about twice as long. Let's say you can put up with that, okay? Well, the base model MacBook Air, it still only ships with eight gigs of memory in 2022. The system sucks up north of five gigs just to even exist. And so by the time you open 10 or 15 browser tab windows, even in an efficient browser like Safari, you are entering the limits of what the system can handle. And the M2 relies on that flash storage to swap memory, pushing stuff to disk. But that's the thing, that slower SSD will really rear its ugly head and there are noticeable performance drops even moving between apps when your system memory is full. That is something that was not even experienced on the M1 MacBook Air. So then put up or shut up, right? This is not a pro machine, just buy more memory and storage space if you need it. But herein lies the issue that I have with the MacBook Air. In the United States, by the time you spec up the Men 2 MacBook Air to 16 gigs of memory and 512 gigs of storage, which is the minimum configuration that I would recommend even for casual users that hope to use this machine for the next five years, you're spending $1,600. And that is just over $100 less than what you can get a brand new 14 inch MacBook Pro for on sale. And remember, that's a computer with a significantly brighter, gorgeous mini LED, HDR capable, 120 Hertz variable refresh rate display with a CPU that is 20% faster, a GPU that's more than twice as fast. It's a machine that doesn't throttle and has double the memory bandwidth with three faster Thunderbolt 4 ports and an HDMI port and an SD card reader. It's a machine with significantly better speakers and microphones, and it's a computer that can natively run more than a single external display. The M2 Air cannot do that. It is a device with better battery life than the M2 MacBook Air, and all of that in a package that's just 20% heavier. It's almost nothing for just an extra $100. And that's in the United States. In many other regions like Spain, the M2 MacBook Air is actually more expensive than the M1 Pro, even from Apple. <laughs> so that's where you say, wait a minute, Quinn, that's not fair. Not everyone wants or needs a Pro laptop and they may not see an extra $100 value in that. So then to you, I ask, is the base model M2 MacBook Air worth an extra $400 when you can often find the M1 MacBook Air at just 800 bucks? Be honest with yourself, it isn't. The M2 MacBook Air is shiny and it is new and it is not a bad computer. In fact, it's a really, really great computer, one that I'm sure any owner could love, but it is sandwiched in between two of the best laptops ever made, both that offer an insane value that the M2 MacBook Air simply can't match. And for that reason alone, I can't recommend it to almost anyone. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Thank you so much for watching, and most importantly, stay snazzy. You feel alive, let's hit the dance floor. Don't work too hard, my break a backbone. Return of the Mac, the king is back though.
love and the cash, I never lack those. She saw the stone, you know how that go. Fatality, my diamonds that cold. Versace trunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door, she at the back, bro. All it really take is a little taste. I like girl, blue eyes with a little bass. Here for the thrill, I don't need a chase. 